chapter 4, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And uh, if you remember, Paul is encouraging the Christians at Ephesus uh, to act in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been called. Uh, and what calling is that? What is the calling to which they have been called? You're probably thinking about it. It's too hard. Ministry? No. The body of Christ, Christians. Generally, they've been called to be Christians, right? Christians. Right? Now, as Christians, we can, give, we can describe Christians relationally to the Father. We can also describe Christians relationally to the Son, right? So if we're talking about God the Father, how are Christians relationally described to, in relation to God the Father? Son. Son, right. We are sons of God, right? And we are not sons of what? What's the term he uses to contrast sons of God? Sons of... It starts with a D. Deceit. Deceit. Close. Disobedience. Right? We are sons of God. We are not sons of disobedience. Yeah. So that's how Christians can be prescribed, described in relationship to God the Father. Right? Now, how are we described in relationship to God the Son? In relationship to Christ? church is the bride of Christ, right? He's the bridegroom. And because we are his bride, we are also then what? His body, right? Because we are his bride, we are also his body. Right? What scripture verse deals with that? If you're the bride of someone, you're also the body of your husband. Why? Marriage. Marriage and yeah, this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, right? Um, Therefore, uh, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's what this is from, right? If you're the bride of somebody, you're also part of his body, right? And this applies to us Christians when we're talking about Christ. This is kind of Paul's point. Not just in Ephesians, but through a lot of his letters, right? The church is the bride of Christ. Therefore, the church is also his body, right? And if we are his body, what are we going to... What does that mean for us? Just in general. What does that mean if the church is the body of Christ? Right. Now we share in common his death and resurrection. And that's important, right? Because if we are Christ's body, our death has been dealt with, and our resurrection, right? If we are Christ's body, we have died with Christ, and we now look forward to the resurrection, right? Christ has been raised, so too we can say about the body, the body looks forward to the resurrection, right? So that's a huge, huge thing for us, right? Now another thing is, if we're his body... Who do, we, who do we start to act like? We act like Christ. Right? If we're the body of Christ, we're going to act like Christ. Right? Uh, and so that, that's kind of Paul's main point as he's going to Ephesians. And that's the calling to which they have been called. They have been called to be sons of God. They have been called to be the body and the bride of Christ. Right? That's who they've been called to be. Questions or comments on that? Anything on that? Where are you going? Okay. Well, we are in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. Now we're going to look at Paul's going to describe what this relationship as the body of Christ now looks like. Right? 
He's going to encourage us to act in particular ways. Can someone please read Ephesians 4, uh, uh, verses 17 through 24? Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their, mis in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to the sens sensuality, greedy, and practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way that you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renowned in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Right. So, again, what are not sons of God, but what's the other group that Paul is addressing that he compares, that he says about the Gentiles, they're sons of? Close. That's, that's what Jared said, which is wrong. <laughs> Disobedience. Disobedience. There you go. Disobedience. So you have the sons of disobedience, right? Um, so, if you have sons of disobedience, why is that so damning? Who are they disobeying? God, right? They're disobeying God, and why is that bad? What did God do for them? That's when the new creation begins. 
That's when the old Adam, the sinful flesh, is actually completely killed, done away with, and a new man now arises. That's in Jesus' own resurrection. That's Easter morning, right? Now, you are right, because when does it happen personally to you? In your baptism. That's the, that's the point Paul makes, and I bring this up over and over again because it's a good point to remember. In Romans 6, right, he says that in our baptism we have been crucified with Christ. That is, the old man, the sinful flesh, is killed with Christ on the cross. Therefore, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Right? That's what our baptism does. It unites us to this new resurrection, this new man. But it's not completed yet. And I heard somebody over there give the right answer. When's it going to be completed? When we face Christ. Yeah, when we face we're right, in the resurrection, right? When he comes again, when he raises all the dead. That's when it's going to be completed. Yeah. So it starts now, completed on the last day. Right? Questions on, or comments on what Paul is talking about there? in chapter 4, about this new creation, this new likeness of Christ. <clears throat> because all men were created in the likeness of God, in the image of God, what happened? The fall. The fall. The fall and the sin, right? We fell from that image. And that's the old Adam. So we need to be restored to the image. That's what happens in Christ. It's the new creation. Okay. Let's keep going here then. Can somebody please read verses 25 through 32? Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. All right. So we have a completely different way of acting. Uh, going back to the section we read just before, um, where Paul says about the Gentiles, the sons of disobedience, they have all become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Um, so Paul's talking about the Gentiles then, of course, but uh, you, you can see our own time in that, right? I was just talking with, with Gary before, before Bible class about, you know, all the masses of people that come out for, for all the different sporting events and uh, all of the not-so-Christ-like things that can go on, right? When that happens, um, the sinful flesh has been the same for thousands of years, right? It's kind of my point here. Um, in the past 150 years of America, we've had a very interesting blip in terms of morality, right? So about 150 years, morality in America has actually aligned with Christianity, right? Which isn't normally the case in history. We're coming out of that, and now we're starting to experience what the most, uh, most of the world has experienced throughout time, which is living in a world where people are callous, hard-hearted, given to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, right? That's the natural state of man. Just how it is. Um, but we... We Christians, we who are in the body of Christ, now have somebody to act like, right? We are all members of one another, right? So he says, act like it, basically, right? 
Act like you are actually members of one another. Um, now he says there, be angry and do not sin. What does he mean by that? Or does that phrase sound familiar to anybody? It justifies when people are angry that they can sin. Right, well he says be angry but don't sin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is actually a quote from Psalm 4. Right, so let's turn to Psalm 4. Now, Psalm 4 is the psalm of David, and it goes, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your own on your that own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace. I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. So in the first half of this psalm, in verses 1, or, 1 and 2, what's the problem? What's the problem David's giving? He's not going to go after his own vengeance. He's not going to act on the anger. 
And he's not going to be restless about it either, right? He's actually going to go to sleep in peace because he knows that the Lord is faithful. And he knows that in the Lord he has his peace. The Psalms are a great thing, if you've never done this, just to read them kind of over and over and meditate upon them. That's kind of their purpose. They're not meant to be read once and then you're like, okay, I get it. Like, I don't have to go back to that. It's something that you kind of dwell on, right? And kind of comes out like this. Um, questions on Psalm 4? Anything on that? that? That's what Paul is quoting. Right? He's talking about... Um, one, the sinful condition we live in, right? And so there will we will be sinned against, and we will sin against others, right? But when we are sinned against, he says, be angry and do not sin, right? When we are sinned against, especially by each other in the body of Christ, we don't then go after that person as if we need to get vengeance. That's really the point Paul's making here, right? If you're sinned against by somebody else in the church, somebody else in the body of Christ, don't have a vendetta against them. Part of the same body. He'll say elsewhere that it's actually better. He'll say this in 1 Corinthians very clearly. He says, if you've been defrauded by, by one of your brothers, be defrauded. <laughs> Let it go. Don't even pursue what you've been defrauded, right? Because you're the same body. It's a hard thing to do. It is. And we're only able to do it because we have been reconciled in the body of Christ. That is the only reason we're able to do that. And the Lord says, vengeance is mine. Yeah, right. He says, vengeance is mine. Right? Um, and, again, this is where Paul concludes at the end of, of chapter 4, and verse 32. He says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Right? That's the reason we're able to act like this. We have been reconciled because of Christ's death and resurrection. Now, anything we've been defrauded actually isn't defrauded from us. Because we've been given everything anyways. Right? Again, hard thing, uh, easy thing to talk about, hard thing to do. Right? Um, yeah. So he says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Right? What does that kind of mean, to not let the sun go down on your anger? Don't dwell on it, right? Yeah. Don't dwell on it. Uh, because then if you dwell on it, what does he say? What does he imply is going to happen? Who's going to be given an opportunity? Yeah, Satan. He's going to be given an opportunity, right? Um, yeah. Questions or comments on that before we, before we go through some more, more of this? I think God trumps the vengeance and says, I will give you joy and you yeah. will be at peace and you will be able to get more joy than the person that harmed you. Yeah, exactly right. right. Because of the great peace we've been given in Christ, because we are a part of his body, been reconciled to God and to each other, because we now look forward to the resurrection of all flesh and life everlasting, uh, what could somebody possibly do against us that would really put a dent in that? If you're, if you're taking the birds, I do, they, they can't do anything, right? Um, yeah. And so that's always, it's always good to remember, remember these words of Paul, and uh, pray for the, the faithfulness and patience to actually carry it out when we're sent against, right? Because again, it's uh, easy to talk about, but hard to do when the rubber meets the road, right? It's hard to do when you've actually been sent against or defrauded to actually say, no, I'm going to let it go. And usually the closer the relationship, the harder it is to do, right? So if it's somebody that you kind of just know in the public, right? If somebody, like, takes your parking spot when you're about to get it, you may be angry for a second, but you're not trying to go after that person for months and years, right? Uh, but if somebody, if something like your spouse or your brother defrauds you, that's what causes lifelong, you know, uh, feuds. Okay, so, let the thief no longer steal, 
eleven labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. You notice the flipping there. I love the example he uses, right? Because as a son of disobedience, you're a thief. You're taking from others, right, to supply for yourself. But when, that, when that's been flipped, when you've been united to the body of Christ, when you've been made a son of God rather than a son of disobedience, the thief is no longer taking from others, but what is he doing? Sure. Giving to others who are in need, right? It's a complete 180, right? It's a complete reversal. Um, yeah, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What is the day of redemption? You know, it's... Resurrection. Yeah, yeah, the resurrection. The day of redemption is the last day of the resurrection. So let the anger, the wrath, the clamor, the slander, the bitterness all be put away, right, along with all malice, because God in Christ has forgiven you. Oh. <coughs> Anything else before we go on here to chapter 5? All right, let's all read chapter 5, let's say verses... Uh, 1 through 11. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous and is an adulterer, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try not to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Amen. Yeah. So who does Paul say then, of course, to imitate? Christ. Yeah, imitate Christ, right? You are his body, act like it. You are sons of the Father, imitate the Father, right? Imitate Christ. Um, yeah. And specifically, imitate him in what aspect? What one word? Love. Love, right? Love is really the, the, the crux there, right? Love. Imitate him in love. Walk in love. As Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What's fragrant offering a reference to? Incense. Incense. Fragrant offering. offering is a reference to incense. We kind of talked about this before, how important incense is throughout the history of the church. Right? Yeah. Uh, really becomes the, the symbolism for Christ, right? That, uh, that God can smell the, um, the atonement, right? Which is the incense, which is Christ. Okay. But sexual immorality, all impurity or covetousness, must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, that there be no filthiness nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, 
has no inheritance in the, king, in the kingdom of Christ and God. Uh, why would he compare covetousness to idolatry? How is that compared? What is covetousness? Yeah, you want something that's not yours, right? And what's idolatry? Worshipping idols. Yeah, worshipping idols. Expand on that, though. What does it mean to worship an idol? Something other than God. Huh? Put something else above God. Yeah, put something else above God, something other than God, right? It's a, so whatever, we, we want to be careful because sometimes when we say worshipping idols, what we, what we imagine is like somebody kneeling before a statue, right? That's not really the heart of worshipping idols. The, work, the heart of worshipping idols is putting something else before God. And so if you're coveting, what are you, how, how is that related to idolatry? You're seeking something outside the kingdom of God. Yeah, you're seeking something outside the kingdom of God, right? And as Christians, we do believe in God's providence, right? That all we have is a gift from God, right? And if we are seeking something that God has not given us, what are we telling God? We don't need it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, we're saying we don't need you, God. I want that thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so that that's kind of where you get the comparison there, where covetousness is a casting off of God and a seeking after these other things. A second part to this is covetousness goes usually goes hand in hand with abandoning God. Right. Uh, we, can, we see this happen time and time again, especially in Western society today. Uh, what, what do people go after commonly? Just in general, stuff. Stuff, right? Stuff. They want stuff. And how do you get stuff? Money. Money. And how do you get money? Work for it or steal it. Or or steal it, right? One or the other. But usually you're going to be doing all. So let's say let's take the more legal balance, right? Um, you're going to work for it. And if you want a lot of stuff, how much are you going to be working? A lot. A lot. And what are you not going to be doing if you're working a lot? Worship. Worship God, right? And prayer, daily devotions, right? And worse off, not even going to church Sunday, right? Um, so covetousness really does go hand in hand with idolatry. Okay. Um, an another interesting light which Paul will take covetousness and idolatry in, especially in First and Second Corinthians, uh, is with uh, tithing, right? Uh, because. If you're not tithing, it's usually not because you don't have the money to do it. It's because why? You want to spend it someplace else. Yeah, you want to spend it someplace else, right? Not on something necessarily you need, but on something you want, right? Um, and so if you're not tithing, you're, you're coveting this other thing, right? Instead of desiring the, the flourishing of God's kingdom. Right? Um, so, so Paul very explicitly ties that in in 2 Corinthians especially. <coughs> And that's where you can say things like, uh, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, whatever one sows, that he will also reap, right? Could you imagine a farmer being so scared of not having a crop that he doesn't want to spend money on seed? Yeah. And how does that go? <laughs> he's afraid to fail. Yeah, hey, he's afraid to fail, so he doesn't even spend it, right? And, uh, but then, how foolish is that farmer if he doesn't even spend it and still expects a great, har a great harvest? That's, good. That's foolishness, right? Uh, and yet, Paul's point is that at the church at Corinth, and it's very applicable throughout history at all churches, really, um, that you've got, you get this foolishness of expecting a great harvest when you don't plant anything, right? It's just foolishness. And so, he said, and so, especially that first phrase there, do not be deceived, God is not mocked, right? You are mocking God if you're saying, why am I not getting a good harvest if I didn't plant anything, right? <coughs> okay, so covetousness and idolatry goes hand in hand. Right. And then, of course, we have the, uh, 
there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous has no inheritance, right? Um, our culture more and more is filled with these things, right? All over the place. They're becoming more and more accepted, right? It's not just the things you hear if you go out to a bar at one in the morning when everyone's already, you know, a bit tipsy or not drunk, right? It's, it's things that you hear on TV at like three in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, right? Um, so what's our antidote to this, right? If all of these things are out there in culture all around us, how do we guard ourselves from falling into this? Stay focused on what really matters. Yeah, we stay focused on what really matters. And how do we do that? Stay in the Word. Stay in the Word, right? First and foremost, that's a huge one. Be in the Word daily, right? It does change. It changes hearts. Uh, what's, what's, the second, what's the second really good way? Worship with fellow believers. Yeah, worship with fellow believers, right? Be here Sunday, right? Uh, be here throughout any service we have, right? Along with that, what's another thing? So not just worship with fellow believers, but what else? Pray for the country. Pray for the country, right? That's, yeah, that, that's a good one, too. Point others to God. Point others to God. But we're not just worshiping with the body of Christ. What else are we doing? Going out into the community. Going out into the community. But even before we do that, just being together, right? Not necessarily worshiping, but just being together, right? With the body of Christ. Doing things together. Acting like we're actually members of each other, right? Uh, yeah. So having fellowship events, right? So that's kind of the deal. Right? Uh, spending time together, both in worship and out of worship. Okay. Yeah, and, and then praying is a good one too. That 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 is a huge one. Uh, we we pray for each other and for the country. Yeah, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Uh, therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light, and the Lord walk as children of light. Right? Um, yeah. The empty words we can be deceived with are really, you know, like, oh, it's not so bad, oh, it's, you know, we're just having fun, you know, all these things, right? Um, don't be deceived. And then shine a light on it, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll finish out verse 12 and through 14 there. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And that is a true miracle. Yeah, it is a true miracle, right? That the Word of God does shine upon us and actually uh, takes us from a state of death to a state of life, right? And now we have a different way to live, right? All, all on account of Christ. Um... And I love what he says there, right? Shine a light on this darkness, right? Don't be deceived by this uh, foolish talk. Um, a, a great example of this. Now, I, as, a, as a person, I think he's a, a little inflammatory, so I don't listen to him that much. But you know, you know uh, um, now I'm forgetting his name. Matt Walsh, right? He did uh, What is a Woman? It's a documentary. And basically, he just went around and asked people, what is a woman, right? And it, was, and it was in response to, you know, all, all the transgenderism stuff. But it, it was funny, whenever you would ask people this, they would come up with these huge, long, pa like paper-long, circular arguments of trying to get around their argument, right? And he was just simply saying, no, what is a woman, right? He, he brought it down to the most simple thing, what is a woman? Right? And they, wanted, they couldn't answer, they just kept walking in circles around it. And that, that is kind of true. That, that's a huge example. That's a very hot topic example right now, right? Uh, but we can see this with all sorts of things. People try to explain it with these broad circular arguments that you kind of have to be led into, uh, would really just shine a light on it and be saying, no, let's go down to the, sim the simple fact here. Is this good or bad? And you, you can get to the fact pretty quick. So shine a light on it. Walk as Christ. Um, avoid the, the foolish talk. Any last questions or comments? Red time. Anything else? I think God.
God is so abundant that He can give all of us a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is really true when you think about just the abundant love and mercy of God that all of us have been brought from the state of sons, like sons of disobedience to sons of life is incredible. Being in education, I see it every day. Yeah. That people, especially students, try to change definitions. Yeah. And that's a big problem. That is a big problem, right? Yeah, yeah when, you, when, you, when you're changing definitions, you're changing the meaning of words, and it really is to avoid the actual issue, and it's talking around it instead of getting to it. Yeah. And I try to tell them it just creates chaos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, anything else? All right, thank you all for coming, and we will see you in the